Ed Bernstein Show. Now, here's Ed. Well, sports injuries have really been in the news lately. And with me today to talk about sports injuries is Dr. Matthew Otten. Now, look, we've all seen what's been going on uh, in the NFL with, uh, you know, the sudden, sudden heart attack. But that's not the most common type of sports injury, right? No, absolutely yeah. Yeah. not. In fact, what, what we're just talking about too recently with regards to the cardiac um, incident that occurred a few weeks prior, um, that is an extremely rare event. Uh, what happens more and more and on a more common basis is these wear and tear injuries or these acute injuries that uh, athletes and normal people suffer. And so many of them seem to be the, the knees and the legs. Absolutely. Right. So if you think about it too, I mean, all of our weight that we bear on a daily basis really goes through the knees, the hips, the knees, and the foot and ankle. So those are the guys that really suffer the most. The other common injuries that you always see from a wear and tear standpoint, or kind of a degenerative standpoint, is the shoulders. Right. And then you throw in arthritis. You got that. <laughs> right. Which is growing more and more, giving our aging population too. And there's very limited things from a conventional uh, standpoint that we've done for arthritic patients. Right. So, so what is the solution to this? I mean, I mean, can you avoid some of these things? Let's just talk about sports injuries uh, by themselves. Okay. Now, you're a football player, right? And if you're a lineman and all you're doing is bumping and grinding and falling and knocking and, and I mean, how do you avoid injury? Well, it's tough on your body. So the yeah. real answer is you don't. But you can certainly slow the injury, slow the potential of an injury. You can also slow the progression if you do suffer an injury or even heal that injury uh, naturally, which is really what we're kind of moving to in sports medicine these days. Um, as far as true injury prevention, the best thing to do is stay limber and stay active and stay healthy and strong. That's the best way. But even then, for these big sports guys, these big pro athletes, it's unavoidable at some point in time. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the size of athletes today, the speed, the agility, I mean, it's unlike any other time in, in our history to, to witness what's going on in sports. And, and, you know, I guess everybody's more susceptible to injuries. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And these guys are such high-level athletes and so well-trained that any sort of small motion outside of their norm, that's when they uh, tend to suffer injuries. And so if you take that from a normal standpoint, like you and I, you know, we're not as well-trained as these guys, but if we go out and start doing stuff, there's a real high potential that you're going to have some sort of injury at some point in your life. Right. And then once you get the injury, is it a lifetime blemish? I mean, or is it, or in, I mean, do injuries compound as you get them, or is there a a way to reset after an injury? So that's a good question. So that's a multifactorial answer yeah, to yeah, that yeah. one. Yeah. Um, the real, one of the things that I always say with this is, yeah, injuries, once you have an injury, you're prone to some other type of injury. And that's from a biomechanical standpoint. So basically, let's say you have an injury in the ankle. You're gonna walk a little different. That's gonna affect the knee right. and or the hip. So yes, the answer to your question is, I believe, and a lot of other physicians believe, that injuries are a compounding issue. Um, what was the other question that you threw uh, at me there? Whether you, can, whether you can just reset it and, and, and heal it in such a way so it's not a, a continuing issue. Yeah, so, you, so thank you for that. So you stop the compounding effect, absolutely. Right. Now one of the issues that we've had in sports medicine and orthopedics is conventionally what we utilize is something called cortisone. The problem with cortisone, and this is now widely accepted too, um, the problem with cortisone is it actually has degradative effects. So it actually can deter or inhibit the, uh, respo the uh, healing response. Um, so what we've really started shifting to now in sports medicine and now conventional orthopedic therapies is a broad field called orthobiologics, which is basically taking, as a general rule of thumb, taking something from you that has healing components, concentrating it, and transplanting it to heal the injury naturally. Right. Those things being uh, PRP, stem cell, that, those type of things. But before you get off this subject of cortisone, mm -hmm. because I want to be very clear about this, it, it is good for immediate relief, right? I mean, it help, helps the pain. Absolutely. It's a potent anti-inflammatory. Short term. Short term. Yes. Long term, it could 
retard the, the, the healing? Yes, it has degradative effects. The more right. you do it, the more, de the more potential degradative effect that you can suffer. Right, so you can't live on cortisone shot to cortisone shot. All you're going to do is make your condition eventually worse? That is correct. That is a very generalized statement, but that is a very correct statement that is now um, well accepted within the medical community. Wow. Okay, so stem cell, something mm -hmm. I'm familiar with, because, uh, or not at least the uh, PRP I'm familiar with, mm -hmm. because I have gotten PRP injections in my knee from you. Um, and by the way, it seems to be working pretty good. I mean, I, I was, um, I do a lot of exercising, mm -hmm. and one day my knee got stiff and kind of swelled, I don't know why, and, and I just had trouble walking, and, and it was just a, um, a condition of, of what? What was my condition? You had that early arthritic uh, condition <laughs> yeah. where essentially it's kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back. So um, in patients with early onset arthritis, usually they're taken along just fine. They don't even know that they have any sort of mm -hmm. issues. And then just one small thing can occur which really makes a large inflammatory response and then patients note pain. Right. So I had trouble walking. Um, because it was all swollen behind my knee. Actually, mm -hmm. it was behind the knee is where it hurt, but I guess the injury was in front of the knee. Correct. All right, so, um, so you looked at it. You went into uh, an ultrasound, and you looked at it. You saw whatever you saw. And then you um, took some blood mm -hmm. from my arm. Um, I waited. Uh, you filled up, uh, your nurse filled up a few vials. I waited. You spun it in a machine separating out the plasma? What did you separate out? Yeah, so essentially what you want to do is get rid of the white blood cells and you also want to get rid of the red blood cells. So you, what you want is a very concentrated plasma um, that has very uh, concentrated platelets. And you want your platelets to be anywhere between four to six times physiologic normalcy. So basically there's a, a certain concentration of platelets floating around in your plasma on a daily basis. What we do is concentrate those platelets to anywhere to four to six times where they normally are in order to get a potent anti-inflammatory effect in the setting of arthritis. And how does that cause the anti-inflammatory effect? So I'm going to use a big word here. Okay. Um, it's interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. Um, platelets have a, a chemical, technically a cytokine, called interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. And this is a potent anti-inflammatory. It's kind of analogous to your body's own cortisone, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't have degradative effects. Actually has healing effects, it I does. believe, right? It yeah. does. It has healing effects specifically because there's about 10 different growth factors that are uh, present in platelets. And, and so that just kind of resets your body, um, your gene, I don't know, what does it do? <laughs> well, there's, two, there's a couple different ways of going with this. In the setting of arthritis, um, it offers a nice potent anti-inflammatory um, effect that can last long term. So some patients, you know, it lasts a year. Uh, I have other patients um, that it can last upwards of three to five years. Um, so A, it has a potent anti-inflammatory effect right. in the setting of arthritis. Now, if we're talking about tendons, um, such as lateral epicondylitis or rotator cuff tendonitis that can actually have healing effects on those. Well, now, now would somebody, uh, you try that on somebody prior to surgery? Absolutely. So um, in order to undergo one of these orthobiologic procedures, and let me define orthobiologics because uh, it's, it's a big word. Um, it's often referred to as regenerative medicine, regenerative orthopedics, regenerative sports medicine. It's, so that's what orthobiologic is. Um, orthobiologics is the technical medical word for these fancy procedures, but most patients refer to it as regenerative medicine. Um, but yes, it is a very effective therapy for patients, and it can potentially avoid surgical intervention in the right setting. So you have to pick your patients properly, and you have to pick the injury proper, properly in, or, in order for them to avoid surgical intervention. And, and PRP stands for platelet-rich platelet plasma. plasma. You got it. Okay. And, and, and it seems like, you know, that you're using it everywhere. I um, mean, is it because um, it's, um, it's new and innovative, so we're trying it, or are we really having some results? Like people are growing hair with, yep. with PRP, <laughs> right? Um, they're doing uh, facials, uh, vampire facials, right? Yeah. Um, and, and injecting it into various parts of one's everywhere, body. Right? so to speak. And does it, does it work everywhere? <laughs> it can. So, so 
so we started actually oral maxillofacial surgeons started doing this about 20, 30 years ago. Okay. Um, they published a few papers, and then orthopedics really jumped onto it fast uh, because they were like, well, this kind of makes sense from a fundamental, fundamental and theoretical standpoint. So orthopedics jumped on it really fast about 20 years ago. And after that became kind of established and somewhat popularized by these pro athletes, a lot of other people started doing it in other fields. So dermatologists use PRP, and right. the reason why dermatologists use it is because it's collagen. So it stimulates collagen regeneration, which is the stuff that keeps your um, skin nice and tight. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's other other things, like you mentioned hair, so there's actually certain patient population where you can actually really help maintain um, your hair that you have and potentially regrow some hair. Um, it's a little bit dependent upon the patient though. There's certain patients that respond to it extremely well uh, and there's other patients that for whatever reason, whether it be a genetic reason or something else, don't necessarily respond to it. And, and is that true also when you're using it for orthopedic? Uh, means? That is. So yeah. as a general rule of thumb, um, PRP tends to be very effective um, in about 80 to 90 percent of the population. There is also a subpopulation, and you actually end up being in this subpopulation, where patients do amazingly well with it. Um, it's probably about 20 to 25 percent of the population that has this amazing response to PRP. Um, that is probably associated with genetics. Uh, there's a gentleman out of Florida that's working on the genetic code and why that's the case. But as a general rule of thumb, I'd say about 80 to 90 percent of patients respond beautifully to PRP. Well, and you said it lasts uh, months. I mean, this is not something that is a long-term fix, but requires maintenance? Typically not. So if it's in the setting of an arthritic uh, joint, it requires maintenance. Right. Now, if you take a rotator cuff tendonitis, or everyone else has this one too, lateral epicondylitis or tennis uh -huh. elbow or gol golfer's elbow, um, so if you take one of these injuries, one of these soft tissue injuries, it can actually be reparative to the point where you don't need any other procedures performed, unless well, you re-injure it. Well, that, that would be, and let's talk about the pain mm -hmm. and, and the cost. Okay, uh, which, which pain in and of itself is a cost, right? Yeah, absolutely okay. it is. Uh, look, it's, it's much less painful than surgery, right? But the, um, I'm going to talk from personal experience. Sure. I mean, you get it. A needle put in your, not your knee cap, but or, or in your blood. arm, right? <laughs> but you also have to inject it back into the knee eventually. But you get you have a couple needles, and and it, it really doesn't hurt any more than at, at going to the lab and giving blood. And then um, when you inject the plasma into the knee, it, it stings momentarily, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's gone. I have to say that every time I've gotten PRP, whether it is, I'm not saying this has been your instructions or directions, but every time I have done it, which is, I don't know, maybe over the years, uh, maybe once or twice a year I, I do it for my knee, mm -hmm. um, I've gone home that day and exercised. Have you? Well, I'll yeah. keep telling you don't do that. But I'm the same way too. I got to be honest with you. Usually, so that's a great point. It yeah. doesn't really hurt that much. It really doesn't. There are some patients that have a pretty big anti, a pretty big inflammatory response from it. But the vast majority of your patients are just like you and I. Where look, I tell you to do one thing, but of right. course you don't. And ultimately, though, it's not mm. that painful. Yeah, and and it's not covered by insurance. Right. It's not. So even though it's been around for about 20 years at this point within the United States, it's still not covered by insurance. The, mo, let, me, let me state that the procedures that we're going to talk about today are not covered by insurance. If someone claims that they are covered by insurance, they are wrong. Right. And that's a problem, that it's not covered by insurance, because if, I'm, I'm just... Gauging from what you just told me, like for instance about, about a shoulder um, issue, right? Mm -hmm. If I can heal a rotator cuff with PRP, it's got to be far less expensive than me having to do either months of physical therapy or having surgery. Absolutely. There's a huge cost benefit to this. Um, it's really becoming recognized, this massive cost benefit. It's really becoming recognized by the government. 
Um, they've had their eye on it. I know last time I was on the show during COVID, they still had their eye on it. Uh, th let's face it, things move a little bit slowly in this realm and in this world. Right. It will be covered at some point because of the cost effectiveness. But you're right. If you pay for three injections out of pocket, if you're the right candidate and you have an excellent response, the vast majority of your co-pays and whatever cost you probably would have spent doing physical therapy, surgery, or follow-up visits, there's going to be a cost savings to the patient ultimately with that. Yeah. And stem cell is an entirely different animal than PRP. What is the difference? Okay, so we'll shift talk then. So PRP, okay. and I'll summarize this. Um, so PRP, or platelet-rich plasma, is taking your platelets, concentrating them, re-injecting them. Um, it's the beginning or the opening session to all of the regenerative orthopedic and sports medicine procedures. And the least intrusive of those. Absolutely, right. because all you do is take some blood. Um, but then there's a large paradigm shift. So you got PRP, which is quick, easy, and simple. And then you move on to the stem cell procedures. Now, I'm specifically talking about autologous stem cell procedures, which is your own concentrated back into you. Um, so that's autologous, meaning your own stuff. Okay, so and, we, and where do we take stem cells from? So there's two locations in the human body. Um, I can either get stem cells from the adipose or the fat tissue. Uh, we have a huge reserve of adipose well, and sure stem cells as Americans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm included in this world too. Um, but we have a huge reservoir of um, hibernating stem cells in our fat tissues. Uh, the other option that we can do if you're a younger, healthier patient underneath 65 um, typically is we can do bone marrow. So you can extract bone marrow for stem cells as well. When you, when you say hibernating stem cells, yeah. I mean, why are these guys sleeping? Can we wake so them up and just exactly, let them do the job? So that's basically yeah. what I do. I take them yeah. out of the den when I do one of these procedures. Right. I take them out of the den and wake them up. But that's, you know, this is a huge reserve of stem cells for our body. It's been well known since World War I. Um, so patients with significant burns or injuries to the hand, sometimes what we used to do, and we're starting to do it more and more, is we actually just sew it into the fat and leave them there for a few weeks to heal. And that we started doing that in World War I, actually. Wow. So when you take, is there a difference when you take it from the bone marrow and you, or you take it from the belly? That's a great question. Um, yeah, there's a huge difference. Um, in the setting of so let me, make, let me broaden that back. Stem cells from bone marrow, you're not going to get as many, and it's going to be very concentrated for a specific location. Like when you talked about, I just don't want to confuse the two, when you talked about PRP, you yeah. talked about the, um, the plasma being four to six times more concentrated. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking a different kind of concentration with the stem cells? We are. Okay. We're actually going to talk about volume, like how many stem cells okay. actually. Um, so from bone marrow, you're going to get a couple hundred thousand to a couple million typically um, for most patients. So a couple, thousand, couple hundred thousand to a couple million. From fat, you can harvest 200 million to 500 million stem cells. Oh. So there's a huge number difference. So in general, when I'm doing a specific location um, in a younger, healthier patient, I usually will do bone marrow stem cell transplant. If I'm doing orthopedic arthritic conditions or multiple locations, I'll usually switch over to adipose or fat tissue because of the volume. There's another thing with that too, and I'll try not to get too technical, so stop me if I get too technical with this. Um, bone marrow stem cells will self, so you don't get as many, and they self-replicate about five times. Adipose stem cell you get this huge volume of stem cells, and those guys will self-replicate eight times. So when you use adipose stem cells, you really get a huge volume of stem cells, of mesenchymal stem cells. The other benefit to adipose tissue is you actually save the little fat cells called the adipocytes, and they create a padding effect or a cushioning effect as well in the setting of arthritis. And at the same time, you lose some fat cells. A little bit, not too much. <laughs> I, I don't promise miracles with that. <laughs> in general, though, I, I try and take as little as possible, um, just enough for that specific location in that case, because I want patients to recover. Um, in my procedures, I want minimal downtime. Uh, let's face it, what I do is sports medicine. I don't want you sitting around. I want you up, moving, and recovered within a few weeks. So. Is, is there downtime if you're taking um, the cells 
from the bone marrow, which, which has less downtime, uh, downtime, the bone marrow or the belly? Bone marrow does okay. because it's much less invasive. Right. And when you, but the, but the uh, stem cells, when you compare a stem cell from the bone marrow, one from the adipose, um, are, are they, I know one replicates or whatever the word you used was mm -hmm. more, but, but are they of equal quality? Equal quality, equal type of cell, mm -hmm. um, different volume, different amount of cells. Okay. But yeah, all, all things considered from just taking the cell and what you mm -hmm. typically get, it's about equal. Right. And, and you hear about uh, umbilical cord uh, stem cells? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So let's switch topics here. So we're going to leave from autologous, meaning your own stuff, right. and we're going to switch over to third party. Um, well, although, although, although some women can use their own umbilical cord, right? Was that, yeah, and the yeah. kids can too. Right. So that I think in the future, so um, I get asked this question, um, should I freeze my kids' stem cells? Right. Uh, look, if it's, if it's not cost prohibitive, I think there's going to be real application in the future for this. Uh, I really do. We've already moved towards this route anyway. So, um, so umbilical cord cells typically are taken from a donor um, they're grown in a lab or frozen in the lab and then sent to sent out for utilization. Uh, oftentimes it's wound care, but it's really transitioned into other fields as well. Um, umbel so I think from a general standpoint, and this is important, is that umbilical stem cells and umbilical cord stem cells, the clinical data is significantly lacking when you look at your own stem cells, which is a very important part in this sort of new field of medicine, is lacking clinical data. So it means that we don't know yet how effective it is or is not. It could be, could not be, we just don't have the clinical studies. That's correct. Or the empirical studies, like whatever. Um, because you hear about people flying down to Colombia, other South American countries, getting stem cell, and some people are getting them infused whole body. Correct. What are, they, what are they trying to accomplish? So I think this is a new wave of medicine. This is the whole you know, anti-aging, regenerative as a whole. Um, this is the new wave of medicine. I think we're going to see the huge push in this in the next 10 years. I think it's really in its infancy stage right now. Um, with regards to Colombia and patients flying down to Colombia and Panama, I'm going to refer back to clinical data. The clinical data is really, really lacking at this point in time. Also, you, interestingly, you only hear about the success stories, but behind closed doors, because I know a lot of the guys that have gone down there, there have been lack of success and patients that have had complications. That's not published on their website. So, Whenever people ask me about this and I get asked this question, hey, should I go to Panama or Colombia and have these placental cells injected fully all over and do this two-week process, I say you've got to be careful. Um, there's no proven data on it yet. Um, it may work, but it also may not. Whoa. Clinical data is what it revolves around. Yeah, maybe somebody <laughs> looking for direction. Yeah, throw your hands up. I don't know. That's right. the pro and I have to yeah. throw my hands up too because yeah. we don't have any clinical data to go on. What we do have is you know these testimonials from these pro athletes that go down there or what have you. But um, you know, you, a blind squirrel is always going to find a nut at some point in time. Um, so I really tell patients, I I would be very hesitant to do this. If you're going to do it, expect nothing, and if you get something, great. And I assume it works similar to what we talked about in the beginning of the show of PRP. There are some people genetically that do respond and others who don't. There is probably a genetic component to this, absolutely. Yeah. Also, the healthier you are, you probably have better outcomes as well. Right. Jeez. And, okay, so what, what else is going on uh, in regenerative uh, orthopedic procedures? So there's some cool stuff coming yeah. down the pipeline. Um, one of the things that we're starting to do now, too, is extract your own stem cells, grow them out in a lab, freeze them, and save them for later. So there's a couple companies out here in the United States that are starting to do that. The other big one that you're starting to hear down the pipeline is something called IPS. That's induced pluripotent stem cell therapies. Basically, we're taking a skin cell or a blood cell and we're reverting it back to an actual st a mesenchymal stem cell or a, an actual pluripotent stem cell. That, I think, is going to be one of the bigger things out there that we're going to hear about in the next five years is basically taking some skin cells or some blood cells, reverting them back to a stem cell, and then taking them back to the 
the patient and re-injecting them into the patient. And I, so I would keep your eyes on that. Uh, yeah. That is going to be something that's going to be very big, I think, in the next five years. It's in its early stages right now, but in general, there's so much data um, that's beginning to be published about this stuff. Um, this stuff is also widely available throughout the world at this point in time as well. I think stem cells in a general, um, in a general summation is, is we're really going to see a huge push uh, to utilization of stem cells in multiple facets of medicine. So one case in, in, in particular, there's a gentleman out of Jordan, um, the country Jordan, um, who actually takes stem cells for diabetic patients, transplants it into the pancreas, and has had amazing results. So we're starting to see these guys out there internationally um, beginning to apply stem cells to multiple different facets of medicine. Oh, I love it. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like, like, uh, it's like taking, creating a new cell, you know, taking a sick cell and creating a new cell. Wake up, insurance companies. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> and we need this kind of stuff. It saves right? money, ultimately. It yeah. really does. Look, yeah. I, as a father, I mean, everybody's asking this question about, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of involvement do you want your kids to have in, in sports, uh, you know? Uh, I mean, how do you feel about, uh, you know, I mean, you're an athlete. I mean, and I'm a dad. And, and you're, I mean, you do everything. <laughs> Hike, mountain climb, ski, snow Played ski, rugby. rugby. Yeah. I mean, you do it all, right? I, I do. Yeah. And, I, and I'm a dad. So uh, there's inherent, and this is my answer to this, because my wife and I have this discussion all right. the time. Sure. You know? um, there's an inherent risk to anything that we do. Um, it's minimizing your risks and maximizing your, your output, whether it be emotional output, physical output, whatever, because sports, sports are a real outlet for kids. Um, would, you think, let, would you let your son play rugby? I miss a tough I sport. I would certainly discourage him against it. Okay, okay. <laughs> I really would, and you know, there's no pads. We tackle differently in rugby. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, but any sort of high volume contact sport, I, I would really, I would okay. not encourage. Well, okay. I would not I'm going to put you on the, on, the, on, the, on the spot here. Okay, you're a Canadian, right? Hockey fan, right? Total hockey fan. Let, let your kid uh, play hockey, ice hockey? I would. I would let them play ice hockey because it's a gliding sport, but it's a heavy, it's a high contact sport, right. but I would. Okay. Football, I would, I would not encourage or discourage. Okay. Hey, <laughs> for more information on uh, stem cells or uh, PRP or sports injuries mm -hmm. in general, Dr. Matthew Otten.